the lungs. You, we will take a brief look uh, at the anatomy of the lungs. The definition, the definition of the pathology we are talking about, the epidemiology of it, the etiology uh, or the risk factors associated with this condition, the clinical presentation of this condition, the differential diagnosis, the complications associated with uh, pneumonia, the diagnosis and treatment, prevention and follow-ups. So when we take a brief look at uh, the anatomy of the lungs, uh, we will see that the right side of the lung has three, or is, is, is divided into three lobes. We have the upper, the middle, and the, the lower lobe. When we take a look at the left side, it has uh, two loops. When we talk about pneumonia, we are talking about infection of what uh, infection of the lung parenchyma. When we talk about the lung parenchyma here, we'll be talking more of the alveoli or what we call the the, the air sacs we can see on the on the right side of the presentation. Okay, so the definition of pneumonia is uh, we define pneumonia as an acute infection of the lung parenchyma in which consolidation of the affected parts and filling of the alveolar airspace with exudate inflammatory cells and fibrin is a characteristic. So what it actually means is uh, the lung parenchyma, which basically we are talking about the alveoli is uh, being infected and the main features is that there is a uh, Accumulation of fluid within the alveolar, uh, within the alveolus, coupled with inflammatory cells and fibrin. Let's look at the brief epidemiology of pneumonia. Globally, pneumonia kills over 2.5 million people every year, according to the uh, statistics from World Health Organization. The incidence worldwide of community acquired pneumonia varies between 1.5 to 14 cases per 100,000 people. Pneumonia is the single largest infectious uh, cause of death in children worldwide. And globally, pneumonia kills around 740,180 children under the age of five, accounting for almost 14% of under five mortality. The brief statistics that I had in, uh, in Ghana about pneumonia was mainly on children, in which uh, about 5,000 pneumonia-related de deaths are recorded every year, basically under, uh, children under five years of age. So we'll take a brief look at uh, the statistics at Upper West Regional Hospital. Uh, the general statistics for Ghana, I, I, there was only little information about it, so I couldn't get much information. So if you look at our statistics uh, at the Upper West Regional Hospital, in the year 2020, we recorded 97 cases. In 2021, we recorded 285. And as at the first half of this year, 2022, we've recorded 146 cases of pneumonia. So as we can see, uh, pneumonia is a, is a very common condition in our setting. So we should know how to treat this uh, pathology. We will be taking a brief look at the, uh, the risk factors associated with pneumonia. The, uh, some of these risk factors are one, is smoking, alcoholism. Mostly people, uh, alcoholics are prone to aspiration. And one of, uh, of the pneumonias which we'll be talking about is aspirational pneumonia. Apart from that, alcoholism also causes immunosuppression among people and they are prone to getting infections. Another risk factor we'll be talking about is difficulty in swallowing. We always see in our settings, people with stroke, People at home, they will start giving them food if they are not able to tolerate and at the end they will aspirate it into their lungs and at the end developing into what pneumonia. More to this, people with stroke, mostly they have issues with uh, their, their gag reflexes. People also, or people who also have dementia, Parkinson's disease also have issues with their swallowing. So at the end, they aspirate organisms into their lungs and, and getting pneumonia. 
history of recent cold, laryngitis, or any upper airway obstruction also put the patient at risk of getting pneumonia. At the extremities of age, that is people below five years of age and those above 65 years of age are at high risk of getting pneumonia. Why? Because at these extremities, uh, the immune system is a little bit compromised. Or within children, is less developed. And amongst the adults, apart from the comorbidities that they have, they are slightly immune or they are immunocompromised as compared to, to the young. The malnourished too are also exposed to or have an issue or at risk of getting pneumonia. Why? The immune system malnourishment, as we know, uh, causes immunosuppression. And as the patient is immunocompromised, the likelihood of getting pneumonia is uh, very high. Other comorbidities such as heart failure, renal failure, uh, renal diseases, uh, chronic liver disease, diabetes mellitus, cerebrovascular accidents, HIV infections, uh, people who have their spleen out due to other conditions or splenectomy, long-term or prolonged use of steroids put uh, people at the risk of getting pneumonia. So this is a table showing the risk factors and the type of pneumonia that is really associated So we will be looking at some of the risk factors and the kind of pneumonias that are uh, normally associated with. So the first one on the list is alcoholism. And uh, most of the pathogens that are mostly are, uh, associated with this kind of pneumonia is an anaerobic uh, oral flora organisms. We have Klebsiella, micro, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, and strep pneumonia. As parishioners, I mentioned earlier on people with uh, oral, bad oral hygiene, people who have stroke, uh, or people whose uh, GNS, uh, CNS, or uh, whose GCS are low, uh, has the high risk of what uh, splitting the microorganism from the GI tract, the oral pharynx, uh, back into the respiratory tract, uh, leading to what we call aspirational pneumonia. The other ones, exposure to bat or bear droppings, exposed to patient to histoplasma capsulatum, exposure to farm animals or pattern cats or milk, or exposed patient or people to get a cozelia bonetti or Q fever, HIV or people who are infected with HIV have the higher risk of getting uh, infection by hemophilus influenza, plasma uh, tuberculosis, strep uh, pneumonia. Uh, PCP and the rest. People who are also exposed to hotel or cruise ship travels in the previous years are uh, exposed to getting Legionella of uh, pneumonia. Drug uh, users or people who normally inject themselves with drugs are also exposed to getting uh, anaerobic infection, mycobacterium tuberculosis infection, staph areos infection, including methicillin uh, resistant staph areos infection. So from here, we'll move on. This table is a, is a guideline. So if you have a time, then you go through it. You know each uh, risk factor and the pathogens uh, or organism that are associated with the, with the risk factor. So we'll take a look at the pathophysiology of uh, pneumonia, a brief one. And uh, normally uh, our oropharynx has uh, microorganisms. Apart from the oropharynx, we our digestive tract also contains a basically gram-negative organisms. So by any way, if we aspirate any of these organisms and it gets into our lower respiratory tract uh, and our immune system or the, the mucociliary action, the macrophage, um, macrophages, if they're not able to eliminate all these organisms or if the organism is so virulent or is, uh, the virulent effect is so high, that it overcomes what the body, the immune system, then the patient uh, develops uh, pneumonia. There, there is another way of uh, uh, in which a patient can also get pneumonia, which 
normally it's not the it's not it's not the commonest, but sometimes or there have been cases that has been reported that people with uh, infectious endocarditis through the bloodstream is pressed and gets into the lungs. So we'll be looking at a brief classification of pneumonia. Pneumonia is normally classified according to the settings or the mechanism of acquisition of the disease. So our first on the list is community acquired pneumonia. When we talk about community acquired pneumonia, as the name denotes, this is the pneumonia that is normally acquired within the community. And patient comes in with the classic signs and symptoms, chest pain, fever, cough, patient has no history of uh, admission into the hospital. Number two on the list is institutional acquired pneumonia, which has two settings or two, two parameters. We have the healthcare associated pneumonia. That is uh, uh, patients who have been receiving healthcare in either nursing homes, receiving hemodialysis. Yes, all these people are classified under the institutional acquired pneumonia. Now, another classification that we've been looking through into details is the nosocomial pneumonia, which is also divided into two. We have the hospital-acquired pneumonia and the ventilated-assisted pneumonia. When we talk about hospital-acquired pneumonia, it's a pneumonia that is acquired after 48 hours of admission. And when we talk about the ventilator-acquired pneumonia, it's pneumonia or infection that develops after 48 hours after intubation. We'll be also be looking uh, through aspirational pneumonia into details. Anatomically or radiologically, pneumonia is uh, classified as lobal. When we talk about lobal, that means it's either involving one lobe, two lobes, or the three lobes. Multifocal uh, pneumonia or lobular, or what others call it, bronchopneumonia. This is a, a pneumonia that normally originates at the bronchi and then spreads to uh, the lung parenchyma. So mostly on the X-ray, we see this as patchy or opacifications on the X-ray. Then we talk about the interstitial pneumonia, which is uh, the spaces in between uh, the alveoli, uh, which gets what infected, then spreads to, to almost all parts of the lungs. Now, if you look at the, uh, the classification according to the type of organism, we have viral pneumonia, as we are in the COVID season, we know one of the commonest uh, organism or viral infection that causes pneumonia, we have the uh, respiratory sensitive virus, but we shouldn't also forget that all now, uh, now that we are in the COVID, or COVID is one of the, the, the leading cause or one of the organisms that causes uh, pneumonia. So when we, uh, we see patients uh, at this era or within this time, we should try to do COVID screening for them. We will also classify pneumonia according to the bacterial causes. The bacterial uh, that I mentioned, we have so many uh, classifications that here. We have the anaerobes, aerobes. So a, a classic example, we have the strep pneumonia, which is very the commonest organism, H. influenza, we have mycobacterium, and et cetera. Uh, another classification or another classification that we have is the fungal pneumonia. There are other uh, fungi that causes pneumonia, which we should also be thinking about. Normally, it occurs in the immunocompromise. Some, uh, some of these uh, fungal uh, infections are the histoplasma uh, capsulatum. We will also be talking about a parasite. Normally, uh, it's not common, but we should also bear in mind that a parasite can cause pneumonia. Classic examples, I've just put uh, two or three here, chistosomiasis. Uh, to to plasma gondi. Then pneumonia is also classified as typical or atypical. Typical in the sense that these organisms are, or they are the organisms that are able to culture on the, the normal culture medium or the gram stain that we, we do, we are able to culture these organisms from. But when we talk about the atypical, others also call it walking pneumonia. These organisms under the standard culture medium, we are not able to to see these organisms. That is where the name comes uh, from, atypical or walking pneumonia.
So we are going to, into details about the community acquired pneumonia. As I stated earlier on, this is a pneumonia that develops in the outpatient settings or within 48, uh, within 48 hours. It's an error, sorry. So this is a pneumonia that develops in the outpatient setting. Oh yeah, or within 48 hours of admission to the hospital. So this means the patient had already, the incubation period had already taken place uh, outside the hospital. And the patient can, uh, he comes in with the classic signs and symptoms of uh, this uh, respiratory infection. The commonest organisms that we normally see is the strep pneumonia, as I mentioned earlier on, Haemophilus influenza, which is also common, Morazea cataralis, Mycoplasma pneumonia, we have a chlamydia pneumonia, viruses, respiratory sensitive virus, COVID-19 virus, herpes simple virus, and et cetera. Uh, we also have the fungal, which I mentioned earlier on, histoplasma capsulatum, cryptococcus pneumonia, but it's not all that common uh, as compared to the bacteria causes. We also have the par a parasitic pneumonia, which I mentioned, schistosomiasis, so patient normally will present uh, typically as you can see in the diagram with uh, symptoms of uh, acute uh, or acute uh, or respiratory symptoms such as cough, fever, rigors, pleuritic chest pain. So on examination, we, we, we will find out uh, crepitations, reduction in uh, reduction in breath sounds or reduced uh, air entry crepitations on auscultation, or, or we, we can also hear bronchial breath sounds. We will move to another uh, form of uh, classification of pneumonia, which is uh, known as the institutional acquired pneumonia. At first, uh, we used to classify, uh, or it includes a uh, healthcare associated pneumonia and nursing home associated pneumonia, but this uh, classification is outdated, so we no longer use uh, this classification. So healthcare associated pneumonia is defined as a pneumonia that develops in the outpatient setting or within 48 hours of admission to the hospital in patient with increased risk of uh, exposure to multi-drug resistant bacteria as a cause of infection. So earlier on, people uh, or the earlier classification stated that people who were uh, receiving treatment at nursing homes were exposed to uh, some form of a uh, bacteria or more the normally or on isolation or when they isolate the organism, they normally find out a uh, multi-drug resistant organisms. But the recent studies have shown that uh, those patients we classified under uh, institutional or at risk of getting institutional acquired pneumonia. In the actual fact, when we, we, we do the cultures, the, the organisms are not a uh, multi-drug resistance. So this classification is, doesn't uh, hold anymore. Now we'll be talking uh, about uh, another form of uh, classification, which is called the nosocomial uh, pneumonia. Nosocomial, as we all know, is infection that we normally acquire in the hospital. Nosocomial pneumonia involves two, uh, two type of pneumonia, or we have two type of pneumonia that is classified uh, under nosocomial, uh, nosocomial pneumonia. We have what we call the hospital acquired uh, pneumonia and the ventilator acquired pneumonia. As I stated earlier on, the hospital acquired pneumonia is a pneumonia that develops uh, at least 48 hours after admission to the hospital. And the ventilator uh, as uh, assisted pneumonia is pneumonia that develops after 48 hours of, of uh, ventilation. We are doing all this classification because uh, the organisms that causes community acquired pneumonia and the nosocomial pneumonia defects. So we should know this so that in the treatment, we will, we will know the kind of antibiotics that we will be using. The commonest organisms here, we're talking about the staph, areos, the pseudomonas, and the gram negative for us. Aspirational pneumonia. 
uh, aspirational pneumonia is a pneumonia that is uh, that occurs when uh, one aspirates uh, the gastric contents or the pathogens from the oral pharynx into the distal airways. In the past, anaerobes were the uh, commonest or were considered to be the commonest organisms. But a recent studies have shown that uh, community acquired organisms such as Streptococcus, uh, pneumonia, hemophilus, influenza, Staphylococcus, uh, areoles, and gram negative rusts are actually uh, the commonest organisms that are associated with this kind of pneumonia. But patients who come with a bad oral hygiene, anaerobes, are, although they are not the commonest organisms, they are, they are also included, especially patients who have a bad oral hygiene. The risk factors for uh, uh, people getting aspiration pneumonia are stroke, myasthenia gravis, bulbar palsies, decreased uh, consciousness, esophageal uh, diseases such, such as uh, achalasia or gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, poor dental hygiene, uh, some of the factors associated with this kind of pneumonia. So we'll be taking a brief look at the, the classic uh, presentation of, of pneumonia. Basically, uh, people who have pneumonia, the classic presentation is cough, which can be a productive or non-productive uh, cough. And normally the, the spectrum that comes out, the spectrum that we see can also orient us on the etiology of the kind of pneumonia we are dealing with. Uh, basically when you see, or when a patient brings out a spectrum that looks like current jelly, you should be thinking of a Klebsiella infection. When the spectrum is rusty, which is a current, a, 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 Pathognomonic or is classic of a streptococcus infection. Now, a patient may present with chest pain, pneumonia, chest, or pain from a pneumonia. Chest pain is a, typically a, a patient present with lance, a lancinating chest pain, which is worsened, uh, or people describe it as pyritic chest pain, and it worsened by, by coughing. Patient may also present with dyspnea, or patient may also present with confusion. One thing we should be very, uh, we should be very clear: not everyone will present with a classic signs of a cough, chest pain. Especially, we should take a very care, or we should take notice in the uh, 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 in the adults because some of them they present with only confusion. So when we are seeing any early patients, which we've looked for other focuses and we don't know the, the, the focus of the infection, we should also be thinking uh, pneumonia as a cause because in the early, most of them present with only a confusion. So we should take notice of that. Patient may also present with fever, which could um, normally, the classic presentation is a high grade fever. May, patient may also present with chills, hemoptysis, headache, abdominal pain, especially when it is right uh, lower pneumonia. They may also present with other uh, uh, general signs and symptoms such, such as myalgias, nauseas, uh, nauseas or, or diarrhea. On physical examination, patient uh, may present with cyanosis, we may see central cyanosis, or the patient may present with altered men mental status, as I said earlier, which is very uh, very common in the in the early. So an early patient we see with altered mental status, we shouldn't only be thinking about cerebrovascular accident, but we should also have a pneumonia in mind. Patient may present with hypothermia, that is a temperature or very high temperature, temperature greater than mostly uh, they present with temperature greater than 38 degrees Celsius, or some may present with a hypothermia, temperature less than 35 degrees Celsius. Patient may present with tachypnea, which is a respiratory, a respiratory rate more than uh, 20 cycles per minute. Patient may also present with tachycardia or bradycardia. On the respiratory system, this is where mostly our findings, uh, we normally get our findings. Uh, the patient you may present uh, with uh, decreased breath sounds on uh, that is on examination or on physical examination we might see the patient 
really using the accessory or using the accessory muscles for respiration. On auscultation, we might hear reels or crackles, ronchi, bronchi, or wheezing. The same way we, we can also hear egophony or whispering petrol loci. That is when we, we, we put a stethoscope on the patient's uh, chest and we say the patient should mention one, two, three, or 99. Uh, the normal sound is it shouldn't be increased, but in people with pneumonia, is always uh, is always increase is always increased than the usual. Some may also present uh, or on examination we may we may find out or we we might find diagnosis to, to percussion. Mostly people who present with a pleural effusion, stony dullness on percussion, which is always noted. They may also present uh, or on the our examination. We can sometimes see that the trachea may be deviated to one side. Now we'll be looking at the, the diagnosis and treatment. So with our diagnosis, we will be taking the history into account, our physical examination findings, our investigations, which includes the labs and the imaging. So with our labs, the first thing that comes into mind, uh, we will be running our full blood count or the CBC. And the classic presentation normally is leukocytosis, that's elevated uh, white blood cell count, but uh, with uh, the differentials being a neutrophilia. But sometimes to, uh, it can also happen that or we can see leukopenia. It's not always that we'll be seeing le leukocytosis. But uh, in other situations, when the, the, the cause is viral, we, we might see a lymphocytosis. And most of the viral infections or viral pneumonia also causes leukopenia. So as I mentioned, the typically leukocytosis will left shift. However, its absence, particularly in the adult, should not cause condition to discount possibility of bacterial infection. So when we look through our labs and we found out that the WPCs are less than five, is an omnial sign of impending sepsis. When we see hemolytic anemia, it should ring our, our ears that uh, there is a possibility of, of complication of a um, mycoplasma. We do B and creatinine to help us in determining the severity. Not only that, uh, some form of pneumonia or what we see in the B and creatinine can also orient us in the type of pneumonia we are dealing with. Mostly Legionella pneumonia is always associated with low sodium. That is sodium uh, basically uh, less than 130 in, in most of the cases. And it's also a marker of severity. When we also look at the urea and it's elevated, that's seven millimole per liter or greater than 20 uh, milligram per DL, we should also be thinking of severity. We will be looking at uh, or oh, this is one of the parameters that we, that helps us uh, to determine the severity. So we look at it as one of the parameters in, in the CAP65. Now, another test that we, we are supposed to do is to culture uh, or the spectrum that we get, we need to do gram stain of it. We have to also culture. The color alone, as I mentioned earlier on, can give us a clue. The current jelly, will tell us that there is Klebsiella rusty, or tell us that uh, the infection is probable in strep pneumonia. In severe cases, we have to do the arterial blood gases, which will orient us whether the patient is in uh, acidosis or not. We have to also do blood tears. Normally, in the community acquired pneumonia, which uh, actually, uh, community acquired pneumonia, which uh, it's not severe and patient can receive a uh, outpatient treatment. Uh, normally we don't do blood CS, but those patients we normally admit the inpatient, we have to do a blood CS, which uh, will orient us in the, the kind of uh, antibiotics we will give. The C reactive protein is also important, basically for those that uh, we, we those that we, we, we admit, especially those in the ICU settings. We also have to also do a, the zero nursing staining for AFPs to exclude a, a tuberculosis. And if the patient's HIV or retro status is not also known, 
it's always advisable to also do because some of uh, the organisms that are associated with uh, or it orient us in the kind of organisms that we are dealing with, especially if the patient is HIV positive and is presenting with pneumonia. So we also do our LFTs or the liver function tests, uh, liver function test. Normally, normally uh, people with basal or right-sided uh, lobar pneumonia present with elevated liver enzymes because of the inflammation and that extends to the liver. When we also see hypoalbuminemia, it's a marker of severity. Other tests that we do is the urine pneumococcal or legionella, uh, urine, pneumo, urine, the urine antigen for pneumococcal or legionella antigen. PCR, especially as we are in the COVID season, we have to uh, do PCR for the atypical organisms and the viral uh, pneumonia. When patients have a pleural infection, we have to do pleural aspirate for microbiology and, and cytology. So the gold standard ultrasound, I forgot to mention, ultrasound is also very uh, necessary, especially those with a pleural effusion. Uh, sometimes the chest or the chest X-ray is only able to pick up a pleural effusion uh, greater than 300 mLs. So if a patient has pleural effusion is uh, around 20, 25, the only way to pick it up is by a transthoracic trans ultrasound. Let's look at the complications of pneumonia. So one of the complications, I've grouped them into the respiratory complications and the other complications or systemic. So under the respiratory, we have the paraneumonic effusion, which is the commonest type, and pyma when uh, the effusion gets infected, pneumothorax, lung abscess. We have pericardial effusion, that is when it extends uh, uh, to the pericardium, leading to a uh, fluid accumulating the pericardial fluid, pericarditis, which is the inflammation of the pericardium, meningitis, septicemia, jaundice, then arrhythmias. Our differential diagnosis, uh, we have to take into consideration the history. This will help to guide us uh, to differentiate whether it's pneumonia or it's not pneumonia. So some of, these are some of the differential diagnoses uh, that we should also be thinking about. Pulmonary tuberculosis, pulmonary embolism, lung malignancy, myocardial infarction, uh, congestive, uh, congestive uh, heart failure, pulmonary edema, pulmonary fibrosis, acute bronchitis, uh, pulmonary, uh, pulmonary drug hypersensitivity reactions. Some drugs can also cause pneumonia or pneumonitis, which uh, might confuse us uh, thinking is pneumonia. So we should, our history will guide us uh, to differentiate all this. The main or our main purpose today is on the management of pneumonia. So as I said, the, uh, the classification was to guide us which type of antibiotics we, we are supposed to use. So we have a uh, tools, there are tools or there are in the indices or how should I put it? Yeah, there are tools that are used to indicate whether a patient is uh, or helps in guiding us to in the management of pneumonia, whether a severe pneumonia or moderate or is not severe pneumonia. Uh, so some of the parameters or the some of the uh, tools that we are commonly used that we are looking at are the KEP65 with the modified version CRB, the pneumonia severity index. There are other ones known as COGSU, uh, Smart Coop, but we won't be paying more attention to that. So the commonest one, which is the KEP65, we are going to take that one into detail. So the KEP65 actually uh, has five parameters. We have the C for confusion, U for urea level, the R for respiratory rate, the, the B for the BP, and the 65 for the H. So basically, patients who present with new onset of confusion or the confusion test of less than eight, a urea greater than seven millimole per liter, respiratory rate greater than 30 minutes uh, per minute, BP systolic less than 90 or diastolic less than 60, the a, then age greater than or equals to 65, uh, 65 years. Under this, uh, when the patient, when we combine the total that we will get, the maximum is five, the least is zero. So if a patient has a, a zero to one, uh, then we classify this patient as a mild pneumonia, two, a moderate pneumonia greater than a three, 
three or more, we consider the patient uh, as a severe pneumonia. So depending on this, uh, we, will, we will treat the patient as an outpatient or an inpatient, or we send the patient to ICU. So those with a score of uh, zero to one, without any comorbidities, we treat them as outpatient. Those with two factors, will need a hospitalization and those with a greater than a three or more will need ICU. Okay. With a pneumonia severity index, uh, classify the patients into five groups, uh, five group, uh, using the demograph of the patient, uh, the clinical presentation, the lab findings, the, then the imaging. So with that classification to the uh, class one, class two outpatient treatment, class three, uh, sometimes we will need, uh, or you can consider an inpatient dependent or an outpatient depending on the comorbidities that, that are associated. And uh, class four and five are always those who need a hospital admission. So the pharmacological management, as I said, depends on the, the classification that we've stated earlier on. Patient with low severity or zero to one or score of less than two, who are previously ill with who previous were not previously ill or they are healthy with no risk factors for methicillin resistant staph aureus or pseudomonas we normally give them uh, amoxicillin uh, orally three times daily from uh, seven to ten or the duration is seven to ten days or you can do doxycycline that is if the patient is allergic to the penicillin and then a milligram orally twice daily, or you can do clarithromycin or azithromycin. But others also do the combination. They add the, the beta lactam together with uh, the atypical cover. So if you are not all that sure or not certain, you can do the combination. You do the amoxicillin or the beta lactam plus the uh, macrolide. But for patients with a comid, a comorbid and medical conditions such as chronic heart, lung disease or kidney disease, DM, malignancy, asplenia, or use of antibiotics within the previous three months, it's always better to do this combination. The macrolide, which I mentioned, the, the classic example, azithromycin, uh, clarithromycin, plus the beta lactam, which is a classic example is the um, amoxicillin. Or you can do monotherapy with the oral. Uh, uh, fluoroquinolones, for example, the mosifluxacin, gemifluxacin, or levofluxacin. We should be very cautious uh, when we are giving this uh, the macrolides, especially the uh, especially azithromycin to to the elderly because they call, uh, it causes arrhythmias. So it's always better if uh, they have uh, underlying heart uh, issues. It's better you do the fluoroquinolones. Under the inpatient management, uh, those who are not requiring ICU, we do the combina uh, this combination, beta lactam plus a macrolide. Uh, studies have shown that, in fact, uh, there, is no, there is no difference uh, between uh, the oral route and the IV route, like one being superior to the other, no. Uh, if the patient is able to tolerate the oral route very well, you can even do the orals. But mostly we, we, we start with IVs. But if the patient is able to tolerate the oral as, uh, as soon as possible, you, it's better you switch the, the patient to, to do an oral route because the IV route also has it, its complications. Or you, you can also do this combination, the third generation cephalosporin plus a macrolide. Or you can also do the uh, respiratory uh, fluoroquinolones. But for patients with prior respiratory isolation of methicillin resistant staph aureus, it's better to consider or it's, it's ideal to add MRIC, methicillin resistant staph aureus uh, antibiotics. And then you take a PCR to confirm of the nasal or of the, you take a nasal swab for cultures and PCR. Then you de escalate as soon as uh, the results are in. And for patients with prior respiratory isolation of pseudomonas uh, infection, it's better you add a coverage for it. Some of uh, the antibiotics the, that we can add here, we, we have the carbapenemics, example, meropenem, imipenem. You can also do the monobactams as to 
uh, astronam or you can do the respiratory uh, quinolones example is the floral quinolones but patients uh, who are admitted to the icu we have to consider adding a beta lactam if it's, we are suspecting that it's a community acquired pneumonia but the, due to the severity, the patient is now at the ICU. We do the IV beta lactam plus a macrolide, or you do the IV beta lactam plus IV antinomococcal uh, quinolone. But if a patient has a documented uh, beta lactam allergy, it's good you add antinomococcal quinolone plus astronam. For patients at risk of infection with pseudomonas, pseudomonas it's better you add or it's recommended that you add IV anti-pseudomonas beta lactam plus any of these, either a macrolide antinomococcal quinolone. But if a patient has a doc uh, uh, or it's been documented that patient has uh, allergy to, to any of these, you can give uh, IV astronam plus uh, aminoglucoside. Uh, our next is on the aspirational pneumonia. The treatment, uh, unless, according to the Infectious Disease Society of, uh, of America or the American Thoracic Society, uh, they, don't, they don't do uh, the anaerobic cover unless they suspect uh, that the patient has uh, clinical presentations or history that suggests that uh, anaerobes are are the, 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 the cause of all the, uh, all, all anaerobes are uh, involved in this uh, infection. Uh, so uh, the actual or the European society consider giving IV kefrizon or they cover the community or, or acquired organisms. But when you suspect that there are anaerobes involvement, such uh, as I mentioned earlier on dental careers or empyema on X, when you suspect empyema or when there is a lung abscess, then it's better you add a metronidazole or clindamycin. There are uh, other supportive uh, measures that we are depending on uh, the, the presentation. Uh, we give analgesias and antipyretics when, uh, for the pain and the, and the fever, IV fluid when the patient is dehydrated, oxygen saturation when the, uh, the oxygen the, or they really need oxygen chest physio, especially uh, those who can expectorate adequate nutrition, chest physiotherapy. Now, there is one thing, uh, steroid use, I forgot to add on the slide. Uh, according to the Infectious Disease Society of uh, America and the 2021 uh, uh, sepsis guidelines, uh, the routine uh, giving of steroids is not recommended. We only give steroids when someone has pneumonia and also has uh, comorbidities uh, such as a COPD or asthma, uh, bronchial asthma, or if the patient is in severe uh, septic shock, that is when we recommend the use of steroids. Otherwise, we don't give steroids uh, as, a, uh, as a routine drug in people with pneumonia. So let's look at the uh, way of preventing or the preventive measures of pneumonia. Uh, smoking cessation, better nutrition, life and attenuated influenza vaccine, and pneumococcal vaccine, especially for those at, uh, at higher risk, especially people with uh, chronic heart uh, diseases, uh, liver diseases, uh, chronic kidney disease, lung conditions, or sickle cell, uh, HIV patients, People on chemo on chemotherapy and those uh, who who are more than sixty five years of age. Normally, a follow up should be done with chest X rays after uh, six weeks, and uh, this is normally done to ensure uh, that uh, there is complete re a re a resolution of of the uh, of the of the disease. But when there is no resolution of the infiltrate on the x-ray, then we should also be considering uh, other conditions as the cause of pneumonia. This is where the CT scan comes into play. Thank you. These are my references, uh, up-to-date Medscape Davison 23rd edition, current medical diagnosis and treatment, STG 7th edition, then information department, Upper West Regional Hospital. Thank you.
All right, thank you very much, Dr. Martin, for a good presentation. And uh, we are also grateful to Dr. Vivian for stepping in to project the slice when uh, we're running out of time. And thank you to everyone who has joined us for today's presentation. Like I just put up in the chat box, uh, if you have any questions that you want to uh, put in there, you could make use of that as well. Once we've gotten to the end of the presentation, if you would want to ask your question verbally, kindly electronically raise up your hand, and then I would unmute you so that then you go ahead to ask your question or make your submission. Thank you very much. So looking at the chat box, we have a question in there, which I would be reading so that we can discuss it. That's from Dr. Abdul Salam. It says, a nice presentation. Can the presenter throw more light on the difference between lobar pneumonia and bronchial pneumonia? And then part two of his question is, is there any predilection for adults or children to develop one particular anatomic type? If so, what's the reason? So Dr. Martin, do you have any response to his questions? I would have to unmute uh, Dr. Martin so that, thank you. Okay, Dr. Martin, you can unmute yourself now. Hello, Martin, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. So when we talk about the lobar pneumonia, it's pneumonia that involves uh, one, one or two, one or two loops or more loops, one or two loops, sorry. And uh, when we talk about bronchial pneumonia, uh, it's pneumonia that, that... hello? Okay. Yes, when we talk about bronchial pneumonia, it's... yes, it's pneumonia that normally Normally begins around the bronchi, then uh, disseminates uh, throughout the the intestine the interstitium. Now, uh, kids are more com or more prone to getting a bronchial pneumonia, and adults are prone to getting a pneumonia. Why? Because the, the their lung parenchyma is not well developed in, in children as compared to adults. So, in adults. Uh, the commonest type is the lobar, lobar pneumonia, and bronchial pneumonia is very common in children. Okay, great. So uh, just to add to that, uh, the I see he was is is really a, a great thing that you brought it up regarding lobar pneumonia and uh, bronchial pneumonia, or otherwise also called bronchial pneumonia. A couple of people, you realize uh, in its common practice, I don't know if it's a wrong thing that most of us picked up from medical school, uh, that somebody even has a right lobe, right lower lobe, lobe pneumonia, and then it's just written the bronchial pneumonia. The key word and key difference in terms of the clinical uh, picture that you pick up, bronchial pneumonia, Think of bronchial pneumonia as patchy, patchy consolidation. So it affects the lungs in patches throughout the lungs. And so obviously when you have that, the, the consolidation you don't hear over one lobe, unlike in, uh, what do you call it? In uh, uh, lobar pneumonia where then you have that uh, uh, consolidation over a particular place. And so the clinical features, technically, when you, you listen, usually for a lobar pneumonia, uh, you tend to have the classic signs of pneumonia. So in terms of the percussion note, you have a dull percussion note. Over an area of a bronchial pneumonia, because it is patchy, you, you find that the percussion note is resonant. Obviously, it is not a focal concept. Consolidation. It's not involving, it's not a diffuse consolidation. It's rather referred to as what is patchy. So you percuss over it and then it's resonant. 
but the the reverse holds true for the lobar pneumonia. If I cast over it, it is dull. Now, if you listen for vocal fremitus, vocal fremitus obviously over an area of consolidation will be increased. So in the case of a lobar pneumonia, when you listen over the area of the consolidation, that is where the pneumonia you think is, you realize that the vocal fremitus would be increased. The same with the tactile fremitus. If you touch, again, it would be increased over that same zone. And then the other key differences, obviously when you listen for the breath sounds, typically in the lobar pneumonia, you hear bronchial breath sounds. In the bronchial pneumonia, because this is not a diffuse consolidation here, you tend to hear vesicular breath sounds. And again, it is not a good habit to write bronchovesicular. It is just medical students who probably do not understand what they are listening to that they write bronchovesicular. Because you cannot have a vesicular breath sound at the same time having bronchial breath sound. It's like writing RDT positive and RDT negative, or writing BF or MP, 5,000 scene, and writing no MP scene. So, really, what are you talking about? Are you hearing a bronchial breath sound? Then you should stick out your neck that is a bronchial breath sound. Then, the, in terms of uh, crepitations and all of that, you tend to hear for both the bronchopneumonia and the, uh, the lobar pneumonia. Just like I mentioned for the vocal, the tactile vocal fremitus, the vocal resonance as well would be increased in an area of consolidation. But because in bronchopneumonia and patchy, you tend to have a normal vocal resonance over that area. So it's usually good to differentiate the two to know whether you're having a patchy consolidation because that again holds true for several other diseases as compared to just one lobe that is involved. Now, with regards to the anatomic uh, predisposition, other than the extremes of ages, which you are predisposed to both types of an pneumonia in a way, like Dr. Martin indicated in this presentation, you realize that the right lung has three, three, three divisions. So you have an upper, a middle, and a lower lobe. The left has two an upper and a lower lobe. So again, if you are making a diagnosis of bronchial, uh, of uh, lobar pneumonia, you write left middle lobe lobar pneumonia. Obviously, uh, of course, it means that you don't understand the anatomy well, is that not so? Then the, the, the predisposition rather holds true for aspiration pneumonia. And the reason why that one is uh, so in terms of the anatomy is because of the fact that the right uh, bronchus, the right bronchus has a more vertical, uh, uh, what do you call it, orientation, as compared to the, the left one. Obviously, the left one, because of the heart, it has a more horizontal uh, orientation. And so usually when you have uh, uh, aspiration or when somebody aspirates, it tends to be that they will settle in the more, more vertically oriented right uh, main bronchus. And because of that, you tend to have that pneumonia or that susceptibility more on the right main bronchus rather than on the left one. Again, the right main bronchus has a larger caliber size as compared to the left. So the anatomy holds more for an aspiration kind of pneumonia rather than just uh, typical predisposition to any form of uh, uh, pneumonia, because of course, aspiration, as the word says, you aspirate certain things in, and whichever one that is sharper, likely the organisms may settle in there. I hope we've been able to uh, tackle your question, Dr. Salam. I see two more questions which we'll go through. Uh, so the, the next one comes from Della Woody. A great presentation, Dr. Martin. How different is the modified uh, CRB 65, that's the CAP 65 minus the U from the CAP 65 itself. So Dr. Martin, do you want to take that? Yeah. 
Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, uh -huh. the cap the cap sixty five the cap sixty five and the CRB or the modified version. The only difference is uh, the urea is dealing with the lab, just uh, the, the lab. So normally, uh, oh, hello. Yes, we can hello. Hear you. Yes, the modified version of uh, the CAP65, in which uh, the urea is being eliminated, uh, is useful, especially in uh, settings whereby uh, lab, uh, doing lab becomes uh, very difficult. So with that, uh, we just eliminate the urea, but the other parameters will. So patient with zero uh, to, to one will, will need uh, outpatient or treatment. Uh, two, you might consider admitting the patient then from three to four, this patient will need ICUK. So it's just it's Good. just a matter of the lab. This it helps you when you don't have labs available. Great, fantastic. So the only addition is that uh, both both of them, uh, the both the CAP65 and the one that you take out the urea, that CRB65 modified. Yeah. They, they have a high correlation, I really. Uh, in actual fact, is there's documentation to the fact that the CAP65 was more sensitive as a predictor of death compared even to the original one with the urea. And it's uh, for, for, for more practical use, like Dr. Martin mentioned, especially those of us in uh, rural practice, it's quite difficult getting your urea results ASAP. And so uh, it's more practical to use the CRB65 in the emergency setting whilst you are waiting for that. And it has a very good uh, high correlation with the CAP65 itself. And like I said, this a good predictor of death and serves as uh, a guide for hospitalization, just like in the original form of the CAP65. Great. And the scores are just as he mentioned and we then predicts what next you are supposed to do. Okay, great. Uh, Galaxy A10 that says, uh, please, Dr. Martin, you said CAP community acquired pneumonia developed after 48 hours of hospital admission. What about hospital acquired pneumonia? When do we say it's hospital acquired? I think probably you're getting this as an error. Dr. Martin, can you uh, rectify that? Yes. Yes, uh, when we talk about uh, hospital acquired pneumonia, it's a pneumonia that develops 48 hours after admission. Yeah, 48 hours after admission. Then when we talk about community acquired pneumonia, this one, the patient comes in with his pneumonia uh, or the classic signs and symptoms of pneumonia. The patient wasn't previously admitted, has been in the house, comes and now present with the classic signs and symptoms. But with the hospital acquired, the patient had been on admission. 48 hours later, the patient develops the, or the, the infection or the classic respiratory signs and symptoms. Great. Thank you very much for that clarification. Ayariga Eric said, thank you so much for your usual amazing knowledge packed lectures. And may God bless you. God bless you too. Can there be a common WhatsApp group formed and to it continue? to continue to share, to share, I think it means information for the benefits of all clinicians. Thanks in advance. Yeah, well noted. Thank you very much as well. There are a couple of WhatsApp groups that we are on. Uh, then Galaxy 8 and yeah, I think we've answered this one. So that's all the questions that I have in the chat box and I don't see any hand up as well. So on behalf of all the participants, I would say thank you, Dr. Martin, for a good job done. And then we thank you all who have joined us today for the presentation. Sincere apologies again for the late start today. We got the presenter to be able to share the screens. He couldn't share the screen, so we had to get a way around it. We hope to be able to start earlier next week. Uh, we you see the topic for next week as well on the same platforms that you saw this. Thank you very much and take very good care of yourselves till next week. Bye bye.